Okay. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and we are on to our next lecture in the Sean Horton series. And I'm very pleased that uh, with our colleague, Dr. Helen Murphy, from the Southeast Technical University, and she brought the bottle to prove us today has come to, to the beat us tonight. And uh, Ireland's newest university, absolutely. And uh, Helen has a strong connection with UCC, having done a PhD here from education. Um, and I think the title of her of this evening would resonate very well with Sean Marco, who was very much steeped in adult and community education. So it's, uh, I suppose um, the main trust of what he was interested in. And um, I think uh, also, when we forget this, um, he was an innovator, and these people uh, made all the changes in adult education. He was part of the company of Aintis, which is a really to help as well. Um, so I think uh, this idea of uh, adult education in the changing time is really appropriate and apt. And I'm really pleased that you have agreed to come from the Ireland's newest university to uh, speak to some nice and power to really power to hear you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, just want to Hi, James and his colleagues, uh, Matthew, um, from the Centre for Adult and Community Education in UCC. Very pleased to be here this evening and um, very honoured to be invited uh, to speak as part of your public lecture series uh, on a topic that uh, has changed as well. It, it's really what I do and what I believe in uh, in adult and community education in an area of you at of lifelong learning. So, very happy to be here this evening in a new building in UCC where we have absolutely online is deeply kind to you, perhaps the amazing views that we have on a beautiful uh, early summer evening uh, here in UCC in Cornwall City. So um, the, the title of my uh, talk this evening is Reimagining Adult and Community Education and it's looking at it in the area of lifelong learning and I'm going to talk a little bit about what those words might mean. I'm going to talk a little bit about what I have um, experience of which is looking at adult education in community settings and how it happens, what it looks like in practice and uh, then maybe some thoughts um, for us to consider as we kind of move into a new era, really, um, a post COVID uh, global pandemic crisis in Ukraine, climate change, maybe huge, huge challenges in front of us. So, it's looking at all sorts of questions in terms of the role of adult and community education in that space. So, um, just as, as Shane has very kindly pointed out, uh, I am uh, formerly of WIT as of uh, First of May, and we became the Southeast Technological University, uh, where we merged with our colleagues in IT Parliament. So, um, and this is my first presentation in part, part of the SETU, so very pleased to be uh, able to do that and to show you our new Ireland brand and new logo. All I have here is just a very brief introduction to myself. Um, I, I work in WIT for the last 15, 16 years, and I've had a number of different roles in the area of education, literacy education, and uh, now at uh, School of Education and Lifelong Learning. I live in Tor, uh, which you can see there, the Lumpy Strand, and uh, I put some pictures of um, some um, people that have inspired me, and I suppose adult education is as much a philosophy and a belief and a value system as it is a process and a pedagogy. And uh, so I put some pictures there in terms of maybe where my beliefs um, come from. Uh, my dad to the far right corner, who we lost a few years ago, which I was very, very close to, was a huge believer in education. And his name was Murphy, uh, as is mine, and uh, we're not related to um, the talk or who, but um, my dad was a classic middle, middle child in a small farm and family. And his only, I suppose, way of changing his opportunities in life uh, was to complete secondary school, which at the time in Ireland was um, female. And then he went on to complete, he trained as an accountant. But he thought the value of, I suppose, education. At times when, uh, I suppose, there wouldn't be any history. The first person who decided to complete secondary school. And uh, then he went on. So that really gave him a huge belief in education for myself and my two brothers. So 
was something that um, I suppose I would say uh, outside of maybe when it was not true or um, uh, being, you know, um, uh, inheriting a uh, uh, large sums of money, education is really a true way of changing life's opportunities for people. A couple of other people that are there, Paolo Freire, um, who really has informed our thinking in adult education, um, uh, a critical community activist in Brazil, where um, he really changed how we view uh, literacy and um, the importance of people who are able to read and write, but how we can help people need to be able to interact with each other at a social community and really at an overall society level. And uh, he really changed a lot of how we understand um, power uh, relationships in society and adult education is, is really about that. It is about equality and offering equality of opportunity um, to all of those involved. But who have informed, I suppose, my, my, my PhD and my own doctoral studies for people like Stephen Brook Pierce, and even Mark of those who I know gets a lot of criticism these days, but um, he did come up with the concept of anthropology and some of the concepts which are about working with the process of working with adult learners, which uh, I still hold very true. They're very interested to me in my case. And then uh, Mary Hamilton, who works with David Martin, and they really were some of the initial, I suppose, scholars in the area of adult literacy um, in Lancaster in the UK. And uh, certainly when I joined the RIT, um, they were people who I tried to really read widely to understand their views on adult education and adult literacy. Um, just, I, I just one um, slide, these are really kind of thoughts about sometimes um, adult education and um, people are confused now. I found this out when I was doing my own doctorate that um, a lot of words used around adult education, community education, and lifelong learning, and not everybody has a very clear understanding of them. But, and I've given up a few definitions there of what they might mean. For example, community education, which really is the part of what we talk about this evening, and um, example of learning, which takes place in local community settings. And, you know, um, and it is very, very learner centered, and we have you know, and the equality of power distribution, the learner and the facilitator work together in adult education uh, and in community education. Lifelong learning, a term that we use all of the time, but I'm not. Continually asked, really, like I'm learning what does it mean? Is it for everybody? Does it start? Uh, is it for each grade? Um, what does it look like? And we hear a lot of talk about it in our policy rhetoric, so uh, which tends to be very, very focused on economic skills and the acquisition of skills, which maybe is not all of what life I'm learning is about. Which maybe it's about more, more than that. So, to maybe give you a sense of um, my, my own practice, I suppose, um, as an adult educator, I thought I'd give you some examples of what community education. Mitigate adult education looks like in WIT, LICT, and I hope I bring a couple of examples um, to this presentation and um, this evening. Because um, I don't know, for me, I need to um, see and maybe experience uh, what, what it means. So, first example I have is, is in WIT, and this is um, a partnership that we have ongoing with NALA, which is National Adult Literacy Agency, and um, for over the last 20 years or so. And we worked with them, I mean, it started very, very small. It was looking at, we had a huge survey in Ireland in 1995, which was the International Adult Literacy Survey, which uh, was conducted by the OECD. And the results of the survey were very, very shocking to um, education policy and stakeholders all across, where it really was one in four adults in Ireland had unmet literacy needs in a difficulty. Uh, reading and writing at a level that would allow them to engage with their family, with schooling, and with, with jobs and society in general. So that kind of statistic um, hit hard and was something that the policymakers, I suppose, if they found the attention of policymakers, so we knew that we needed to do something that people in four hours in Ireland were suffering, um, and when we had a back, I suppose, with um, the literacy skills, we needed to do something about it. So our partnership with NALA, was about working with people who were working with literacy learners, with adults, um, and we work with tutors, facilitators, community education facilitators, and adult education tutors all around Ireland. Typically, um, there are people who would have worked with part time tutors, some of them were voluntary tutors who worked in the literacy field, and um, they really, I mean, we started out by one very small uh, initial. Program and that really developed into a whole suite of programs um, there. Which the reason I suppose those programs were they were it was a very significant departure in the early noughties, if you like, 2002 2003, to have an award, a professional development award in adult literacy. 
And it was about, um, I suppose, combining both theory and practice because all of the people who were on the programs that we were delivering at the time were all adult patients and practitioners. Over the years, and that's up to, I mean, our newest program as part of portfolio instruction, PhD in education, uh, we um, introduced in 2019 actually before COVID. So uh, we now have programs that six out of seven ordinary degree, honours degree, masters, and then into structure PhD. Not everybody um, will progress, but it gives people an opportunity. It's a ladder of progression where people can. What's attractive about these programs is that they're delivered and they're designed specifically for people who are working in adult education. So they're providing, they're bringing their practice to the last two years, it has been. A lot of work that we've done has been online, um, but typically, um, and they will um, interact and learn and do the new child's peer to peer learning um, where they share practice with people all around the country uh, working in similar fields. I have Lana there because Lana um, was one of the first students that I met when I started. I started with Routine in 2005, and Lana at that point was doing higher search, which is the um, entry level qualification at level 6. And uh, Lana, over the years, she's a good education practitioner, she would have been. Uh, worked for years in Young Valley Mall and uh, also uh, worked with the education training boards in Toronto um, uh, in BC. Uh, but um, she did a, a degree, a master's in um, bio research and family literacy with us. And she came to um, think, she was thinking about doing her PhD and she chose to do it because she had done all of her studies in Young Valley And we were just delighted that she was going on. And I have her there because um, she really embodies. Um, the importance of the work and uh, also um, how a practitioner has kind of engaged um, with, with the field of uh, practice that is family literacy. So, and she's still currently doing work on PhD and doing well. That, that, that I picked up a little clip of her winning awards and everything. So, just a um, few other words on the um, NALA project. Um, it, I've mentioned theory and practice, so it is very applied in nature. So it's about taking a theory like group work, like how adults learn, and bringing that back into the classroom and working it through from a pedagogical and methodology point of view. So it's, yes, taking the theory but putting it into practice. Um, the programs, um, and now we have a pretty significant difficulty. Their input on the program, which is very much on a co design and co creation perspective, brings, I suppose, best current thinking and, and best research in terms of adult literacy. They're very involved in um, literacy at national and also at European level. So it brings that into our programs that makes our programs, it brings our programs are current. Um, so, uh, next example that um, I, I thought about because I was directly involved in this one also in very recent years. Um, some of you may come across the um, idea and the concept of the Citizens Assembly. It was pretty much established in Ireland um, in 2016 and 2018, the first Citizens Assembly. So, what it was, and you may have read about it in the press at the time, the crucial section of the public to study a number of different issues. And then information is presented or was presented to provide a common set of facts, a label option, were considered, and recommendations were put forward to government at the time. So, one of the recommendations that came out of the first um, citizen assembly came from Sean Healy in Social Justice Ireland, and it was the concept of public participation networks. So, it was how do we get community and general, um, the general public involved in decision making on local level? So the county councils and the government plans would be um, supported by the Department of uh, Rural Development uh, created these public participation networks, which are volunteer networks. I didn't know a whole lot about them until we were asked to work with them and provide training for them. And really what they're doing for me is they are um, typifying what Fairy is talking about when we talk about having to understand reading the word to read the world. These, the thing that we were providing for the volunteers was to enable them to participate in the meetings that were happening at local and at county and um, county council level, uh, which they wanted to get involved in and have a say and have a voice. So um, there's over 16,000 volunteers nationally in PPNs, and over 31 PPNs nationally. And um, so to just Scarlett and um, both Sean and Colette um, worked with myself and a number of colleagues, putting together a short training program, as I said, to equip these volunteers so that they could um, participate with consultants in the meetings at local and um, council level. So over the last two years, um, what we, we spent about a year developing the program, the program was called Creating Capable Communities. And um, 
What's very interesting is that the volunteers, as you can imagine, are hugely diverse. So people of all backgrounds, all ages, all educational profiles. Um, and we had designed a program which was to be delivered in a blended format. And I think the design was signed off in February of 2009 or 2020, and then fully happened in March. So everything had to go fully online. So we did that, and um, I think it worked quite well. It's, it's, um, the program runs over about eight weeks, and people have a combination of this based uh, live online or asynchronous activities. It is a function program, and um, as far as I'm aware, we have over 300 people now that have had a people to finish the program over the next six months or so, so we've been working towards the end of 22. But it has been um, a hugely um, collaborative project with Social Justice Ireland, and we have um, some of our lectures um, facilitated areas such as social enterprise and so on, and they bring in expertise on social justice issues. So it works really, really well. I think it's an example of adult education and community education. So, and then I have two local examples, which um, uh, myself and colleagues in WIT have been involved in, but this one is very much my colleague, Dr. Mary Fenton, in Department of Education. So she works with um, there's an eco park uh, in John Mill, which is um, just outside of Washington City, and um, it is a rural enterprise um, and social enterprise uh, unit, and it involves, I suppose, supporting rural social enterprises in, in, in very rural settings. Supported by what we see that, what the childcare community, we developed a Mary and her colleagues developed a certificate in social enterprise, which was really again about giving people who are working in these such small social enterprises so to give the skills and competencies and tools that they need in order to develop and further develop their um, their businesses. Um, so uh, it's just a snapshot of it. It's, it's a level seven program and a 30 credit program, but has been very, very popular. And uh, the, it has been doing fully online for the last two years. And that in itself, I suppose, has allowed additional people to access the program. It's one of the only ones. And we're, we have a number of people from Social Innovation Ireland, some very different experts who um, can drop in. That has been one of the advantages of online learning that we have more and the availability of maybe expertise in those particular areas that can drop in. So that's um, uh, one other example. But just one uh, final example, which is a, a partnership that really um, is ongoing since an um, Access 2000 project. So before my time, it would have been my predecessor, Dolores Gilbuli, who would have set up a partnership with Waterford Women's Centre, which is a community centre in Waterford. And they um, started many, many years ago um, some informal training um, for community education in, um, in partnership with the Women's Centre. And that has since developed into a full level six certificate in community education. And um, the participants are women um, who are accessing support and looking possibly to work either as volunteers or in a big capacity in the community. And what the um, partnership provides, I suppose, is for the Women's Centre, which is kind of, um, by childcare supports, a safe study space, and opportunities for um, uh, people to interact, and then we provide the um, interactive workshops and the program for the day and the opportunity the award. There is an opportunity to progress, and we have many people who chose to do so. So, um, again, community education, it's, the numbers um, tend to be quite small, but that's the nature of it, it's quite personal, and um, we tend to develop very, very long term relationships with um, many, many individuals working there. Um, and I just picked up, I was just looking at their, their recent work there, um, and I came across a video which was done on International Women's Day, and um, I should have checked if this is going to work, but I'm going to see my, uh, if it would say here. It should... It's an example of this is some of the wonderful activity that happens in Portrait Women's Centre. I came across this very recently and involves some of our um, facilitators uh, and some colleagues from the ETHW and the WIT. And as I said, it's uh, just a light caption. I like to capture, if I can't dance, I don't want to be part of your um, And finally, just in terms of uh, Barbara Mead, who was, uh, 
anthropologist uh, in the States, um, and she talked about not underestimating the power of the small group of committed people to change the world. In fact, it is the only thing that ever has. So, um, I, I, I thought that was a powerful statement. So, back to um, what we were talking about at the start of this, which is that I suppose I'm making the point that words matter. And when we talk about adult education, um, uh, it's very important that we talk about more than programs and processes. There is a whole value system that underpins, and a philosophy that underpins adult education and indeed community education, which um, is not necessarily based on economic outputs, it's not, it's not necessarily based on what we call an education neoliberalism or basically a form of capitalism. It's not based on um, doing something for economic gain. Adult education is about equality, it is about enabling um, individuals who many may have not had the opportunity to access formal education beyond um, uh, mid teenager years. And what adult education does is obviously give them an opportunity to come back without any barriers, come back, test it, try it. And but that the atmosphere of the environment and how we work with adults is completely different than what because people still come back to us and, and um, describe very, very vividly and um, very, very important things. So, um, and as I said, um, lifelong learning, um, um, ongoing engagement with learning, and that is formal and informal. And I think we've lost examples of formal uh, lifelong learning through um, a lot of economic driven and subsidised uh, programs that the government has been um, active, I suppose, in promoting. Um, there is an element of free adult education now, which didn't exist. 15 years ago, for people who want to still retrain, and that opportunity is there. Statistically, I mean, the research shows us that typically those people may be well qualified before they come back in, so they typically are people who have already succeeded at some level of formal education and are coming back again. So, uh, some of what adults and community education is addressing is the gap between both uh, of those uh, cohorts. Um, so again, and just to reiterate, uh, Sarah is very, very powerful statement um, about learning to read the word in order to read the word. And for, for us, definitely in community engaged adult education, that's, that's a very important part of it. So, um, just a few more um, maybe considerations or comments on how, and again, part of this was based on my own research when I, I was working in the field for about 10 or 12 years before I embarked on PhD in this area, and it was really so that I could understand better the conflicts and the tensions between the different aspects and different components of what was talked about in policy and actually what I could see happening on the ground. And um, one of the pieces of analysis that, that I would have done was based on the difference between the kind of language used in our first national policy for adult education, which was the Department of Education in 2000, and that was a white paper on learning for life. That talked about issues of access, equality, inclusion, and community education. So uh, the basis for it and, and uh, stakeholders involved in it were people who were actively involved in adult education and community education at the time. The policy discourse has really considerably changed, um, and even in the last maybe four or five years, I took that excerpt from the National Strategy in 2014, which has subsequently been um, well, an updated version has been published in the last two years, but it uses the same terminology, and you can see there that. Um, it talks about community skills uh, as a resource, as a driver, as a driver for productivity, supporting the economy. I mean, social inclusion is maybe one uh, you know, uh, line there. I'm not sure how seriously we can take that through uh, the overall focus you can see there. So, um, so I suppose um, some of us working in the field um, have a responsibility to ensure that the informal and non formal aspects of adult and community education, the quantity piece, the access piece, and um, the piece that really does make a difference to people's lives, is advocated for and remains part of what we offer um, in universities, in higher education, and the teaching process sector. Um, and again, this is um, a quoting a colleague here at UCC, um, Steve O'Brien is there, but again, I'm just showing the difference in European policy um, 
It started in 1972. We talked about democracy, uh, um, access to education for liberation, fulfillment. But you can see as, as the years are going by, we're talking about productivity, economic development, and a strong economic focus. And first, Fiesta, who um, I have the pleasure of being a lecturer at UCC about seven years ago, and um, he gave a um, couple of wonderful talks. But um, one of his publications and um, one of his statements is that Learning to Be, which was an original um, European paper written by four at the time in the 1970s, has become learning to be productive. So we're no longer just learning to be, we're learning to do something, to be productive. And um, Steve O'Brien here in UCC talked about it in his book, that's the new memorandum. Um, in 2000, he talked about it connecting with neoliberal ways down as the practices that don't pertain in the educational representation. So, again, a little bit critical of the very, very strong economic um, focus, let's say, in what European policy is looking at. So, as I said, just raising some contradictions in what you'll see um, in the field of adults and community education in an area of lifelong learning. You'll see the contradiction between formal and informal. Not all education needs to be formal. We know that um, informal learning, peer-to-peer -peer learning, learning in networks, learning in communities is as important as formal learning. Um, not all education needs to be an adult or community education. Certainly, but it doesn't always have an economic focus. That contribution focus is a critical part of it. Um, we have, um, uh, and this continues to be a balance between trained qualified staff and volunteers. What is the role of the volunteer in community education? Are they being supported? Um, are we using our um, volunteers? Because volunteers used to be a huge part of adult and community, uh, community education, and that is disappearing. But with that, we may be losing some of the actual riches um, of, of what the ethos and the philosophy is about. We're increasingly um, across higher education, and that includes adults and community education, increasingly um, regulated. So there are increasing requirements for quality, um, quality which nobody disputes how important that is. But sometimes um, additional bureaucracy uh, rules and requirements can start with innovation and creativity and really stop some of the progress that, that works. So it is a, it's a balance, a delicate balance. And then in the future, which we strive to be inclusive, but um, when we put up a lot of barriers to adults returning to education in terms of the type of programs, the access requirements, funding, and so on, we may indeed be excluding them. So I'm, I'm going to um, finish on kind of the future, um, just some considerations or points on future for adult education. Um, there's been considerable debate um, in Europe over the last two years. Um, where all of the European member states have been asked to sign up to the European Agenda for Adult Learning. So, a general memorandum has been signed up at the end of last year, which is called the New European Agenda for Adult Learning, and um, it sets out five kind of key priority areas um, to be focused on for the next eight years or so, 2030. And um, I think these are interesting. I think we'll see increasing examples of often when this is fully implemented over the next couple of months, we see national governments and agencies have a huge role to play here in their role as the government representative on the college. And um, we see it rolled out in Ireland. So they're talking about five priority areas, and those areas include the governments of adult learning, and the strong focus on whole of government, national st um, strategies, and stakeholder partnerships. Supply and take up of lifelong learning opportunities with sustainable funding, accessibility, and flexibility. Um, equality, equity, inclusion, and success, uh, emphasizing the professional development of adult learning staff and the mobility of learners and staff, quality assurance and active support, business attitudes, and finding for the green, um, to address the green and digital transitions and related skills. Please. So I think anybody involved in adult and community education or with an interest in it will, will be mindful that they are things that they're grappling with right now and they're going to continue to be priority areas for the next number of years to come. So maybe with um, just thoughts um, and um, maybe reflections on thinking about what the role of adult and community education is in times of crisis. Um, we've had the last two years have had the COVID uh, global pandemic and how adults, the role that adults and community education played in supporting uh, learners throughout that. 
we have the crisis um, in Ukraine currently, and um, how can adult and community education help support um, activities and support here in Ireland um, and indeed elsewhere? And also climate change, um, one of the things that the challenge is becoming a real reality um, at the moment, um, and how to get what kind of role does adults and community education have in terms of this huge, huge um, global global crisis? So um, that's my um, presentation for this evening, and um, I know that many of you are maybe watching online. Very happy to take any questions or comments that people have. There's my email address there, um, which is completed on the site. And um, just want to say thank you. Um, thank you very much, Davis. Thank you very much, Matthew, for inviting me here this evening to see you. I'm very pleased to be part of the celebration of 75 years, which is a really significant achievement in terms of um, the work that has happened in the centre in Cork and much, much larger fields. Um, I met you this evening before um, uh, my talk, and uh, I was telling him that only uh, in very recent months, in the last two months, I've come across yet another international academic who I'm um, participating in an online meeting on an Erasmus Plus project, and he asked me to no change the story of And I said, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it does bring, to, bring uh, very, very much to home, um, which is the, the very wide range of network that you have created and nurtured and established, and I was really mentioned for that. And through our networks, through our personal relationships and connections, is how I think we all kind of grow and uh, further develop our, our, ourselves. So, so, thank you, and for that. Thank you. No, it's just a little Yeah, I think that makes sense. Oh, it's really good. It's very fantastic. I mean, the whole thing around the civil situation has been such a... Uh, and 